So I don't know what you believe about kids, that kids are fat, their parents are feeding them like greens and having them run on a regular basis and get a lot of physical activity, but those pesky genes of theirs just start manifesting raw matter out of nowhere and storing it as body fat. There's nothing I can do. Better hope that this pharmaceutical company comes up with a drug that I can inject into my ass on a daily basis so that my genes stop randomly manifesting matter out of thin air. If you diet, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you lose weight, right? For many of us, we can go on a diet, something like The Biggest Loser, right? You mm -hmm. go and you trick people, you make them work out for 10 hours a day, and then you feed them 500 calories. For most people, they will acutely lose weight. But 96% of those participants in The Biggest Loser regained their weight because their brain worked well. It was supposed to bring them back to store what they needed or what the brain thinks it needs. So when she says that most people, first of all, that's, that's the first disingenuous thing she said. When you diet and exercise, most people will acute, acutely lose weight. No, 100% of people lose weight if they are successful in sustaining a caloric deficit for a long period of time. Now she used an extreme. Not only did she use the biggest loser, which takes people who are morbidly obese and who are tasked with losing hundreds of pounds within a single season, but then she uses the example of working out 10 hours a day, which nobody does, and eating 500 calories a day, which nobody does, even the contestants on that show. The average person who's overweight needs to eat 1,200, 1,500, 2,000 calories and work out maybe an hour a day, maybe even less to get started. So the fact that she's starting with those extremes, not off to a great start. And the reason that the people on The Biggest Loser who do overwhelmingly gain the weight back, it's not because they are physically incapable of keeping the weight off. The fact of the show showed that they are able to lose weight. The sustainability has to do with habits and lifestyle. You have extremes of putting people into this environment where there's like drill instructors and there's a team environment and it's very good for the radical changes they were trying to make but it doesn't reinforce the habits you need to sustain weight loss because when you go back to your environment when you go back to uh, your life where you're left alone with your own thoughts your own compulsion they basically gave you a life raft on the show and then took it away when you left of course you're going to go back without further intervention. The exact same thing would exist with addiction. And I'm going to be drawing a lot of parallels to just run-of-the-mill substance abuse because the same dynamics are really present. You can take somebody and put them in a retreat where they don't have the ability to leave and go get their fix, where they go to therapy sessions all day, where they're in a team environment, where they're really in touch with their feelings and they can spend all their time focusing on themselves. And the second you put them back in the stress of life without the tools needed to sustain uh, that sobriety, relapses are very common. But it doesn't change the fact that there are environmental factors, there are factors that involve personal agency and accountability that are not only helpful in finding sobriety, but they're actually essential. And without them, you're not going to get a good result. So willpower, throw that out the window. My last patient that I saw today was a young woman who's 39 who struggles with severe obesity. She's been working out five to six times a week consistently. She's eating very little. Her brain is defending a certain set point. Throw willpower out the window because she has a client who apparently is working out five and six days a week and eating very little. The first thing that is so infuriating about this is that to get to these conclusions, she must just be taking at face value that when somebody tells them they're doing X, Y, and Z, that they're actually doing X, Y, and Z. Not only do you not have the luxury of doing that as a doctor if you want to get close to the truth about what's going on with your patient, it is actively negligent to assume that everything your patient is telling you is correct. Anybody who's gotten a hundred dollar certificate and gotten a job at a corporate gym has dealt with regular clients who will tell you to your face after they screw up because in the beginning they will screw up. Failure is part of the process. But that shame drives them to lie to you, to, to tell you a different story. And this is actually part of the compulsive behavior, the whole journey. It involves a lot of self-talk that is not necessarily rooted in reality. And learning how to curb that and hold ourselves accountable, that's just part of basic human growth. But we know what it's like to try to get somebody to lose weight. And they're telling you they're doing everything right while you're witnessing them sandbag their workouts. You, you see them skip out on the days where they were supposed to come in on their own, where they were supposed to do 45 minutes of cardio, and they did 15 and left. You know what it's like to have these people tell you they're doing everything right and then their friends are adding them out. Like, no, 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 so-and-so was at, at Taco Joe's for Taco Tuesday and they were taking down $5 margaritas because they had a stressful day at work. And then you hear the rationalization. It's like, well, Friday is my cheat day, but you know, Thursday, it's kind of like Friday part one and then I'm a little hungover Saturday morning so I get a little hair of the dog and then we go to our favorite breakfast spot because you know, bacon and eggs and an omelet and a sack of pancakes really helps me get the weekend started off right and get over the, the hangover. I have from Friday night. 
all this shit compounds. And that is, that is very normal. That is very normal for people that are even actively trying to create change in their own life. There's that resistance, but it takes work to move past that resistance. A lot of these people that they cite who have been overweight their whole life, they have been struggling not because their body is giving them natural resistance, but because society is reinforcing to them that there's nothing wrong with them and they shouldn't really have to change. So on the one hand, yeah, they wanna lose weight because literally everything is better when you're not morbidly obese, but that's conflicting with the, the story we wanna tell ourselves, which is that the way we wake up without any thought or effort is just beautiful and we don't have to strive to represent our, our truest, most excellent self, that however we just kinda of roll out of bed is great and that there's nothing wrong with us, it's all a society. It's a very tempting story to, uh, to take in and to believe. So all of these people that are saying, no, I'm doing everything right, almost none of them are doing everything right. I compete in a weight class professionally and I still fall off the wagon. I still have trouble with cravings. I still, if I'm being honest with myself, don't always meet my caloric goals. Don't always meet my cardio, my exercise goals. I don't always get into the deficit that I wanna be when I'm cutting. And that's a very hard thing. And it leads to this kind of non-linear progress over time. Over time, by paying attention, I still get net progress. But week to week, day to day, it's a constant struggle. And if you're being honest with yourself, you're gonna realize that. And that's gonna be the first step to getting yourself on the right track to actually adopting good habits. On the topic of weight loss, if you are interested in losing weight, building muscle, getting stronger, I have an app for you. This channel is proudly sponsored by the Boost Camp app, which is the easiest and best way to get access to strength, programs from your favorite creators, including myself. There you can find my programs, Bull Mastiff, Kong, Full Sturker. There's programs from Mr. Natural Universe, Alberto Nunez. There's Cody Lefevre's GZCL. There's Brandon Campbell's PHUL, Dr. Swole. There are all kinds of programs that are absolutely free from a wide variety of experts in the field. Boost Camp is just super easy to use. It's the only way you should be keeping track of your workouts. I mean, the library of programs by itself is a great educational tool, but keeping track of your numbers week to week, tracking your progress, it's, a, it's super exciting. It makes training addicting because you're always looking forward to updating those numbers. I highly recommend it. Thank you so much to Boost Camp for sponsoring this channel. Now back to the show. I've always heard that it's the fast food, that it's the Diet Cokes, that kind of thing, that is the instigator. Is that true? So I think we have to look at the different causes of obesity as a big pie. And that's one factor. But notice how I'm using this part of the pie, right? But the number one cause of obesity is genetics. That means if you are born to parents that have obesity, you have a 50 to 85% likelihood of having the disease yourself, even with optimal diet, exercise, sleep management, stress management. Holy crap, this clip made my blood pressure spike the most. First of all, it was a weird comment that the interviewer said in the beginning. I always thought it was the, the fast food and the diet Cokes. That shows how fucked our narrative is when it comes to something as straightforward as dieting. And by the way, dieting is straightforward. For 99% of people who just need to weigh less so they don't get diabetes and heart disease later in life, it is 100% move more than you eat. That is it. It gets a little more complicated when you wanna hold on to a lot of muscle while you do it or when you want to perform well while you do it, like bodybuilders and strength athletes have to do. But as far as just not being overweight and getting all those negative health effects, move more than you eat, period, full stop. If you're tracking, you're good. Now getting to that point might be a little trickier for most people because there's a behavioral health component that goes into it, which is kind of hard to work around. But you can take solace in knowing that there is a very solid, very rigid, very unyielding set of steps you can take that gets you to where you wanna be. So when I hear somebody like this say like, oh, I thought it was the fast food and Diet Coke, like nobody's ever gotten fat from Diet Coke. But because our attention gets pulled all kinds of different ways, there's discussion of weight loss, and then there's like obesity and fat acceptance, and then there's discussion about health, which is like a different thing, and that's different than performance. So somewhere along the line, people read articles about, you know, the impacts of Diet Coke on, on eating habits, or the impacts of Diet Coke on like hormones or whatever, and they start digging around in the weeds, and you start to lose the forest from the trees, and you end up adopting like a lint roller, you end up picking up all of this trash because that's what most of these studies are, is absolute trash. And you end up completely adopting these bad ideas that don't fit together into a cohesive narrative that helps you live a better life. It's really infuriating. And then what she says, she acknowledges, oh, it's a piece of the pie, but it's this piece of the pie. So let's take the fact that human beings are not perpetual motion machines. We do not have the physical ability to manifest matter out of thin air and store it on our bodies as fat. That means as a matter of pure physics, if we do not consume the amount of energy that we expend, we will continue to lose weight. 
That is a fact that is true for 100% of people. So the only thing that is left is how your behavior works into that. Now, if we're talking about genes being the biggest factor, like uh, if have a thought experiment where like everybody eats the exact same thing, in that situation, you're going to have different body types and genes are partly responsible for that. There's a little bit of wiggle room there. Some people will store more fat. If you take it one step further and you have everybody eat the same proportionate to their BMI or to their body fat percentage or to their, to their weight, then you're gonna have that close a little bit more. There's still gonna be some variability, but a lot less. Eventually, if you hold everybody to the standard that you have to eat as much as you need to keep losing, everybody is going to get to a point where they find the right amount of weight where they can continue to lose. That should be the most empowering information you hear. It doesn't matter. The fixation on what's easier for the other guy does not matter. If there is a, a prescription for food intake that gets you to where you wanna be, the only thing you need to concern yourself with is what do you need to do to do that? And eventually you can gain those habits and you can start eating in a way that, that takes you to that path in the most productive and self-empowering way possible. So when people see families that have obesity, the assumption is, oh, what are they feeding those kids? Yeah. They're doing something wrong. My God, the, the, the whole thing about kids and family, like. Of course, like fat people have fat kids because I don't know if any of you out there know this, uh, kids don't typically feed themselves. They typically aren't responsible for buying groceries, for ordering when they go out to dinner. Uh, they usually are obligated by their parents' command to finish their plates and eat things in quantities that they don't want to. This is the point in your life where habits are first developed. This is why the discussion about obesity in childhood is so important because the environmental component, the adoption of habits, the things that get normalized, that get imprinted into our brain by virtue of repetition when we're very young, oftentimes becomes how we are as adults, overwhelmingly. Look, like human beings are a funny thing because we all have these basic primal instincts, but every one of us has to fight against them constantly for civilization to work. Take being a man, for instance, and this is a fun conversation I have with my wife a lot, because if you have a woman who didn't grow up around a bunch of guys or with a lot of brothers, very often women have no idea what growing up as a man is like, whether you're talking about puberty, sexual development, how our brains work. There's this surprisingly big gap between how men and women operate. The thing is, men are shit shows. <laughs> like anybody who's gone through male puberty, who knows the age at which you can't wear sweatpants anymore, where you have to con you can't focus on math class because you're having to consciously remind yourself to participate as a civilized human being and not focus on what your brain wants to focus on, which is uh, Mrs. Jameson's new sweater and how it fits her just right. These are all things that we have to learn. And at no point are men off the hook for having to learn how to get by, no matter how hard these impulses hit us. There's a thing I'm not willing to give up, which is the role of human agency in forming not just a healthy individual, although there's that, but a healthy society where there's actually a network where everybody, by virtue of being accountable to themselves and everybody else, reinforces everybody else, which means you're part of this like cohesive tight unit where best practices are enforced, which means not only do you get to take pleasure in doing things you know get a better result, but you get to benefit from the fact that you get that better result in a much easier, straightforward fashion without building a whole complex around it and feeling like you're a piece of shit because you keep stumbling and failing. This is all integral to striving towards a society that works well. And it's so disheartening to see this because people with their own uh, agendas, people with their own incentives will misrepresent their profession, they will ignore other professions, and they will just speak so obtusely about a topic that requires a little bit more than the direct experience they have. So yeah, when you're talking about kids, kids are fat 100% because their parents feed them too much. Just like a kid that is malnourished is malnourished because their, their parents didn't feed them. And that's where CPS gets involved. So I don't know what you believe about kids, that kids are fat, their parents are feeding them like greens and having them run on a regular basis and get a lot of physical activity, but those pesky genes of theirs just start manifesting uh, raw matter out of nowhere and storing it as body fat. There's nothing I can do. Better hope that this pharmaceutical company comes up with a drug that I can inject into my ass on a daily basis so that my genes stop randomly manifesting matter out of thin air. Don't you think if people walking down the street with obesity, stigmatized as they are, shunned, don't you think if they could lose weight, and keep it off they would. To have this perspective, you have to be completely ignorant of behavioral psychology. And this is a problem I have with the medical field in general is because 
so many issues have overlapping uh, things that need to be figured out that require expertise from different fields. So you get this big problem where people, medical professionals, will speak way outside. They'll way outkick their coverage when it comes to what they're an authority in because this is the way they've been trained to look at a problem and they're either not able to or not willing to concede that there are other things that are important that they're not as briefed on. Some of it's ego. I think some of it is financial incentive. If you're a hammer, you know, everything becomes a nail. If you are an obesity specialist with a special emphasis on genes and you represent a drug company, everything is something that can be fixed with a drug. But the statement, don't you think if they could, they would, because there's all these negative consequences? There's a couple ways we can go here. One is by talking about the consequences where, I'm sorry, fat people are not wildly abused their entire life. You can be treated poorly in some situations and still be treated well in other situations. It does, the worst you get treated out of your entire life doesn't tell the whole narrative. I was a fat kid. I got bullied as a fat kid. I've seen people who are fatter than me get bullied horrifically. I've also seen people that were fatter than me actually have meaningful relationships, be very popular, be treated very well, do well at their jobs. I live in Texas right now. There'd be a lot of fat people in Texas. When I see these overweight moms pushing their overweight kids in their strollers, I don't see checkers being rude to them. I don't see people eyeballing them when they're stuffing three shopping carts to the brim with snacks and, and Cheez-Its and goldfish. I see people everywhere at the million Whataburgers that are around here. You see people that are 400 pounds in their giant beige Suburbans ordering five Dr. Pepper shakes. I don't see people mistreating them. In fact, you can watch my 600 pound life. You can watch the thousand pound sisters. And what do you see? They have boyfriends. Wherever you see some bedridden female who's so overweight she can't leave her house, there's gonna be some skinny dude in a trailer right next to her who's ready to cover himself in Astroglide and just get right in it. People have meaningful relationships. They're able to survive. People get away with what they can. And the only reason these people do is because they're able to do it without immediate consequence. It's not until you get the diabetes or the heart disease that it really is a problem. Also, there's the issue of what she means by if they could, they would. What does it mean to, to be able to do it? You could do it. Does it mean that uh, you physically have the ability to do, it, to do it like we just covered? There's this physical uh, list of things that you can do. And if you check them off, you're golden. Or is it you can't do it because you have a flawed brain and it's it's the flawed nature of your brain that either leads to compulsion or leads to bad decision making and we've reduced everything down to the point where, where well, your genes make your brain and you didn't choose your brain, therefore, you're actually not accountable for the decisions your brain makes. And you get to this really weird point where everything gets deconstructed, where nobody's accountable for anything and while it might even sound rational in the moment, especially if you've had a few too many edibles, eventually you have to tether your policies to real life and the whole thing falls apart. We are frustrated every single day when we see patients who desperately need to lose weight to reduce the diabetes, reduce the hypertension, stroke, heart disease, and we can't give them this fabulous, robust medication that is very effective and safe and we can't give it to them because insurance won't cover it. I receive emails about denials that state that we're denying this because the doctor has not counseled the patient on behavior change as part of this. That's where the stigma of obesity comes in. Mm -hmm. The idea that the patient can do it with diet and exercise. You would never do that to a patient with hypertension or heart disease or type two diabetes. Tell them that you just, just don't eat sugar, you'll be fine. So right there, she's not acknowledging the difference between having a disease and all of the actions you do before you get the disease that are not only optional, but that are destructive and inevitably lead to the disease. When people have diabetes, you absolutely do say, hey, stop eating sugar. You absolutely do say, hey, if you lose weight, you might be able to kick this thing, or at least you won't suffer uh, the same negative health effects. But to say that when people are voluntarily behaving in a destructive uh, set of behaviors that inevitably lead to these negative health effects that you would never consider behavioral interventions, that is the most absurd shit in the world. And this is where I start to depart from the things that kind of make sense, that I kind of agreed with them on. They're little nuggets of truth that they start with, but then they take it so far. I have to call it evil because one, these women aren't stupid. They're highly educated. If they're saying something that's untrue, either they know it's untrue and they have an incentive to say it, or they're just so lazy and negligent that they really think that their little scope of, of expertise is really all you need to know about this subject, in which case I think there's still culpability. But it's not that they're dumb. They know what they're saying. There's an incentive for them to say it that's financial, and it comes 
at the at the expense of the health and the stability and the security of the people they are directing this message to. So it's voluntary, it's malicious, it's damaging, it's destructive. It's not just the health aspect. This chips away at what it is to be a human being. This chips away at the fabric of a society. It's not just about the individual trying to find out what works for them. It's about every individual being accountable to themselves and the person next to them so that we develop good habits, so that we teach our kids at a young age how not to engage in compulsive behavior, how to be responsible, how to be productive citizens, how to manage their anxiety, their sadness, their emotions, their fears in a productive way that makes them not only happier, but makes them less of a burden on the people around them and further reinforces the good results that everybody gets. Is relieved that at last she has a highly effective medication to offer her patients that's safe, according to the FDA. What the medication does. It's part of a new generation of medications that brings about an impressive average loss of 15 to 22 percent of a person's weight, and it helps keep it off. A major issue. Doctors Apovian and Stanford have been advising companies developing drugs for obesity, including the Danish company Novo Nordisk, an advertiser on this broadcast. And there you go. They're working in conjunction with pharmaceutical companies. This is how they make their money. My dad was actually part of this industry. I remember going with him when I was like 10 years old uh, to give a speech. It was at a football game. We got to sit in the skybox at a St. Louis Rams game. And he was giving a pitch on behalf of a drug company. And he got paid a lot of money to do it. When you see the money that these people pay out to doctors, the first thing that should pop into your head is, what is your incentive to represent the truth versus the best interest of the drug company? This doesn't just go back to, is the drug safe or not? Does it do what it, what it claims to do or not? This goes to, is a pharmaceutical intervention the best way, the most effective way? Are there negative effects to going this route? Not just from the drugs, but from society teaching themselves that they should be able to act however they want without consequence, because that is an assumption of this whole argument, this whole presentation. So when we're talking about genes, there's two components. There's the body, how your genes synthesize protein, what they do with the food you eat, how your hormones respond and so on. And then there's the mind, your psychology. Well, what are you compelled to do? Is there a compulsive behavior you have to address? And what they've said repeatedly with regards to the body is that genes store uh, fat regardless of diet and exercise, which is absolutely ridiculous. That's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard on public TV. So that leaves us with the psychological approach, which begs this question, is there personal agency? Should we build habits? Should we teach people? to be uh, better agents for themselves and the community they live in like we do with everything else? Or do we acknowledge that the way your brain is formed and the decisions you make is a byproduct of your genes? So it's really talking about the same thing. So even if it is a behavioral problem, it still goes back to your genes and oh, by the way, we have a drug for that. Now I've already said, I'm not willing to give up ground when it comes to personal agency. It's like, it's like people working. I don't see it as an optional component of society, something that we can move away from. If you want people to be treated like hamsters in a wheel or, or in like Wally, where it's a bunch of obese people floating around in mechanical lazy boys that are hit, taken care of by a big AI overlord, which by the way, Wally is like the most underappreciated representation of a very likely dystopian future. If that's what you want, then you are happy to take this as an answer, that technology should be moving us to a point where we can do whatever we want without consequence. I'm not gonna get into the philosophy of why that's fucked and how that's going to lead to a whole existential crisis that's going to make people less happy, that's going to lead to more discontent. I'm just going to say that technology as it stands right now isn't even there, so it's not even worth talking about because we don't have the ability to do what we want without consequence. So we have to meet reality on reality's terms because they've already said that they believe the body hoards fat regardless of calories in, calories out, and they've already said that it's your flawed brain that is trying to find the set point. It's not you, it's your brain, and we have a drug for that. So their basic assumption must be that you should be able to eat whatever you want and not have any consequences. And I think that is a patently evil perspective that only serves the interests of the people that stand to make a fuck ton of money off this, which is why I have no problem calling it evil. So let me know what you think, guys. Go ahead and leave your questions and comments in the comment box. I really enjoy doing videos like this. So if this one does well, maybe I'll do a few more. Leave whatever topics you'd like me to cover uh, in the comments. Until next time, this is Bromley. I'll see you.